All right, I think we're live. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for coming to our spring virtual conference. Um, I will just continue with a couple thank yous while people roll in. Um, first, I want to thank Craft Beer Professionals and, and Andrew for setting all this up. Um, as, as I'm focused on more of the development and the technical side here uh, with precision fermentation and not so much the, the public facing side, we really appreciate all their work um, building this so I can just jump on and talk to you all about things that I'm excited about. Um, so with that, we will get into our presentation. Um, so as you see there, my name is Dave Frizzell. I work for Precision Fermentation uh, here in Durham, North Carolina. Um, we are a, a company of about 25 people um, developing the real-time fermentation monitoring technology. Um, and we'll get into all those details as the presentation continues. Uh, so this is, the <laughs> I forgot this slide was in there, of course. Uh, I, am, I am considered the senior product development specialist here at Precision Fermentation. Um, as far as my background goes, I've worked uh, in craft brewing for about six years at this point. Um, I started up at a uh, German lager producer up in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, I've worked for several breweries here around the Triangle, North Carolina, um, and I've been with Precision Fermentation for just over two years, uh, helping them develop this technology and, and really share why we think it's special. So this is what we're going to discuss today. Uh, first, some of the potential issues that may come about with traditional methods of fermentation management. So uh, what we've been doing up to this point to make sure that our beer is on track. We'll discuss uh, the, the ins and outs of real-time fermentation monitoring, um, including what exactly we're going to measure during fermentation, uh, what the benefits of those measurements are, how, that, uh, how graphing can really improve your understanding of what's happening with your beer. Um, Correlating empirical data and subjective evaluation, really just comparing the data that we receive from sensors with the data we receive from our own mouths, making sure that that beer is exactly where we want it to be so that you can replicate it. And finally, some of the additional business benefits. Uh, we have some case studies for some, um, for some users that we have, some, some customers of our system, and uh, really what they find to be some of the biggest benefits. So for, let's say, thousands of years, uh, our, our methods of fermentation monitoring or management has been add ingredients together and uh, pray, I guess, uh, just hope that it turns out OK. Um, and then several hundred years ago, we got the introduction of manual instruments. So we'll be able to now take empirical measurements of our beer in progress. Uh, one of the downsides of that is uh, we consider this a snapshot view. It is a data point in time uh, with, a, with a fixed time frame on it, which is very helpful in terms of making sure your beer is where you want it to be at a point in time. But it is kind of narrow in its scope. So we're trying to expand that out just a little bit. Um, and to sort of drive this point home, I love this chart. This is one of my favorites to show um, because it is a graph of all of the various stressors put on your yeast crop over the course of a single generation. So from propagation through fermentation and into storage, every single one of those lines are uh, sources of stress on your yeast that ultimately affect your beer in the long term. But realistically, none of these actually measure your beer. And so we have this uh, entire metabolism of an organism uh, combined with all of these organic raw materials. And when you put all that into an industrial setting, i.e. in a stainless steel tank, really have uh, not a lot of visibility into what's happening. Um, and so with all of this moving around in the background, you need to be able to not just take a snapshot of what's happening, but really get a full picture. And this is just to drive those points home even further. Um, I, a lot of these things I'm not trying to put on a single person, but mistakes happen. You know, one person may account for parallax in a uh, in a hydrometer very slightly more than one other person, um, and that can lead to just mistakes that pile up over time. Um, this can lead to a lack of control of your product, 
reduced uh, repeatability of those products. And ultimately, uh, perhaps not the most efficient process from start to finish. This is a business at the end of the day. Uh, we do need to make sure that that beer goes through the process as efficiently as possible and gets into a customer's hands so they can enjoy it as quickly as possible. And then finally, we're, we're I hesitate to say towards the tail end of what uh, of what COVID-19 did to our industry, but uh, we may see some repercussions going forward, uh, reduced physical presence in the brewery. So when you have fewer people in a brewery, you can take fewer manual samples. Uh, I, I see this as, a, as an ongoing trend moving forward. And so we get into real-time fermentation monitoring. Um, this is a, a, some terminology that we've sort of developed alongside um, the products that we've created. And it is focused on gathering and presenting empirical data in real time, moment to moment, and ongoing through the process. So we'll get into how we do that here in just one slide, but the, the really important part to take away from it is rather than going into the, uh, the brewery and taking a manual sample of a single tank and taking all the various measurements of that and writing it down and then moving on to the next tank, that's very time intensive and you get that snapshot that we were talking about, which has been useful up to this point, but we can make it, I think, a little more useful. Uh, this is what we've developed. I won't spend too, too much time on it, but on the far right side of the screen, you see a black box with a button on it. That is our sensor hub. Um, it contains uh, two pumps and a handful of sensors. It pulls in beer during fermentation, uh, takes measurements automatically, sends that beer back into the tank, um, and it is equipped with a Wi-Fi transmitter. And so just to the left of that, you see our web app, our console. Uh, so this will run on any iPhone, or excuse me, any mobile phone, tablet, uh, computer, anything like that. Um, and it will accept all of that data, present it to you, and allow for uh, data analysis as well as presentation. So this is a, a term that has been drilled into my brain and I actually quite like it, data to decision. And it is kind of a mantra uh, that we use to emphasize what we do, what, what this process is for. So we gather that, that real time, high frequency, high quality data and present it in such a way that Brewer could use it to either detect something uh, going potentially wrong with yeast or maybe something that potentially happened during the brewing process, uh, which can allow for earlier intervention to potentially save that batch of beer. So for instance, um, if you have pitched yeast that is maybe towards the end of its life cycle, you've gotten your 10 generations out of it, and you think maybe that yeast is right on the border, but you pitch it anyway for whatever reason. Um, being able to intervene as early as possible Repitching, reoxygenating, making sure that yeast has its best shot to ferment correctly. We'll save that batch of beer going forward. And getting all of this data early and, and making sure that that yeast is where it needs to be will allow you to make that decision as early as possible. Um, and so from there, you can correlate those actions with the outcomes of the beer and then determine if that beer is good enough to hit market going forward. So we gather all of this data and present it in such a way that it will be useful for you to make a decision. And I think that's important. We're not trying to explain to brewers how to make their beer better. We're just giving them the tools to make their beer as good as they can. And I keep saying present data. This is what I mean by presenting data. We're gonna discuss graphing quite a bit. Um, and that's because you can take as much data as you want, but unless you do something with that, you can't gain a lot, of a lot of knowledge from it. So gaining knowledge from a high volume of data, in my opinion, requires graphing. So for instance, let's take our, our example brewer here uh, who has a lot of time on their hands um, and they take five parameters. They take gravity, temperature, pH, conductivity, and uh, pressure. They take that twice a day over the course of a 14 day fermentation. That's just for one tank. And they have gathered 140 data points which is significantly more than, let's say, most brewers that I know personally. Um, what we're presenting in this real-time fermentation monitoring gathers 14,000 data points over that same fermentation. Um, 
that is obviously exponentially more. And you really can't do a lot with that data if it's just data points on a piece of paper. You need to graph it in order to gain some idea of what's happening. And so what parameters are we discussing here? Solved oxygen, gravity, pH, temperature, pressure, and conductivity. Um, a few of those you may already be very intimately familiar with. You take them uh, you know, for every batch of beer going forward so that you know that the beer has started at the right level, that it has reached the right level towards the end of the, the process, and that you know that this beer will be on par with other examples of that brand. Right. Brand identity is is huge in this market. If you sell someone the same beer twice, but it doesn't taste the same, they're not going to have a lot of faith in your process or your product. And so we really tried to delve into what each of those parameters are most useful for and what they could be useful for if you saw them over the course of the entire fermentation, i.e. moving from a video or excuse me, moving from a snapshot to a video of your fermentation, if you if you understand the, the metaphor. So uh, gravity, obviously very useful for uh, determining the starting and ending points of your beer. This is what most brewers use. Um, it can also uh, aid in early detection uh, of that end of fermentation monitoring. Uh, let's say, for instance, you take a gravity at 9 a.m. every day, once a day for every tank. Uh, for this particular beer, you'll notice that, uh, okay, Saturday the 11th, it's not quite done. Monday the 13th, it's also not quite done. There's a two day gap. So let's say you take that other measurement here on Tuesday, you think, okay, that's pretty good. And then you wait till Wednesday to get confirmation that it's done. But really we know it was done back here on Monday. And so now you have now spent two days ensuring that this beer has reached terminal where you could have started your VDK rest two days early. Two days early is a pretty significant amount of time in most breweries. Turning that tank two days earlier would mean two, three more batches a year in one tank. So using the equipment that you already have with minimal capital input, gaining a, an entire another batch of beer over the course of a year is not insignificant for most breweries. Um, and then on the negative side of that, determining uh, stuck or stalled fermentations as early as possible. Uh, so we can see that this, this graph has a very particular slope over the course of it, and it reaches maximum slope maybe towards the end here, but it has this very consistent trajectory over the course of its fermentation. If that trajectory was the same for 10 batches of this beer, then on the 11th batch, you notice, you know, right around here, it starts to level off. You'd think, well, that's not quite right. Something's a little bit wrong with this beer. And getting that, that notification as early as possible you know, a day early or two could really help you save this batch. Uh, dissolved oxygen. This is one that I really like to discuss with folks because most people have an idea of what it's for and, and how best to use it, um, but maybe aren't necessarily uh, entirely sure of what their process looks like inside the tank. So for instance, uh, we have worked with a brewery who uh, thought they were knocking out at a you know pretty significantly high dissolved oxygen level uh, because they have a DO probe in their knockout line. But that's measuring oxygen straight as it comes out of the tank and into the cooled wort. That's not necessarily the same amount of oxygen that gets dissolved into the wort once it's in the fermenter. So really ensuring that you have the correct level of uh, dissolved oxygen during knockout impacts yeast health and subsequent vitality all the way through the next several generations of that beer, uh, excuse me, of that yeast. So total knockout DO, uh, or O2, I should say. Um, in this particular situation, this is a double knockout beer. So we see uh, the first knockout here, up about you know, 27 ppm, and then uh, the second knockout brings it up uh, again. So it drops off very steeply and then comes back up to about 25 and then drops off again. So that total knockout DO, uh, really nailing that down for each yeast strain is very important to make sure that that yeast has the, the exact amount of oxygen it needs to replicate, but not so much that it undergoes some oxidative stress uh, because too much oxygen can be a negative thing in this situation. Um, and then secondly, 
the rate of DO uptake. So this very steep drop off that we see right after these two knockouts is a very good indicator that that yeast crop is very healthy, very vital. Um, we talk about viability in cell counting quite a bit, but that's just whether the cell is alive or dead. It does not indicate if that alive cell is ready to ferment or ready to replicate and then ferment. Um, so this, this dissolved knockout or this dissolved DO at knockout uh, can be another indicator of that, um, that, that early vitality. And so this is what I, what I was talking about when I said right at knockout. What if you could know that that yeast crop is going to ferment exactly as you expect? Or alternatively, if it's not quite going to ferment exactly as you expect, what would you do then? Maybe you were planning to use this yeast crop in a batch two weeks from now. You were planning to pull from this tank or cone to cone or into a brink and you get uh, this slow dissolved oxygen uptake and this fermentation isn't moving quite as you expected. This would give you a full week or more of heads up to propagate a fresh batch of yeast or find a different tank to pull from or order a fresh batch from your supplier and not have to pay for rush shipping when you suddenly realize that this crop isn't exactly what you were looking for. So these little time-saving uh, endeavors, these, these little pieces of business acumen really add up over time. pH, uh, very similar to dissolved oxygen in that it gives a great early indicator of your, uh, your yeast crop's health. So uh, a couple of things that we look for in pH, generally speaking, and I do want to emphasize that these are generalizations. Obviously, there are edge cases. Uh, if you're brewing a kettle sour, obviously, it's not going to change quite as much because you already have a lot of acid in that, in that word. Um, and so it's therefore very highly buffered and won't move quite as much. But for let's say your general ale, uh, we expect to see a pretty significant pH uh, decrease starting immediately after knockout. Uh, you start producing all of these organic acids to ready their new media for their own, um, for their own fermentation, uh, basically as soon as they hit that new media. Um, so we see this pretty significant drop in pH over uh, you know, the first couple of days. And then it hits this low point, which is good. This total drop is, is pretty, uh, pretty indicative of yeast health as well. We got about a point, maybe a little bit more of pH drop. And then it slowly rises again uh, as fermentation sort of finishes up and uh, the yeast start to reuptake some of those organic acids as uh, you know, tertiary uh, carbon compounds. So the, the two things that are most important to look at are uh, that early drop um, too fast could be in indicative of uh, yeast stress and too slow could be indicative of uh, yeast health. So it is very important to, and we'll touch on this later, it's very important to nail down your brand's identity. Uh, and so every single one of your brands will have very slightly different starting point, finishing point, rate of drop, all that stuff. Nailing that down will be important because that will give you a baseline against which you can compare uh, your next batch. And then finally, uh, the total change in pH. So from the starting pH point down here to the finish, um, obviously this acidity is flavor positive. It's going to affect the flavor of your beer. So there is, it's, it's important for brand identity. Pressure. So the next several um, parameters that we'll discuss are really important for uh, process changes. So for instance, Pressure is very useful as a, a qualitative measurement of your tank. Um, so it can indicate these process changes. So for instance, this is another double knockout. So we can see that it's at uh, 1.2 bar here. That would be the first knockout. They knock out again and get a few more PSI. Um, and then this fermentation continues for about six days. And then they add a pretty significant amount of top pressure and finish up the fermentation under pressure. Uh, that could be splending. It could just be top pressure from a, uh, a tank. But all of these things together, uh, while compared with those previous measurements that we talked about, give you a pretty good indication of what happened to that particular batch and how it would affect that batch going forward. Fluid temperature. I, obviously, it is one of the most important factors to control. I didn't put a lot of text on this screen because 
I hope most of you understand that fluid temperature is very important for beer fermentation. Uh, keeping that temperature control pretty precise is going to affect not only the flavor, uh, the, yeast, the health of your yeast, the rate of fermentation, all of the things that we've discussed up to this point can be affected pretty significantly by fluid temperature. So therefore monitoring it uh, would be very helpful for making sure that that beer is uh, proceeding as expected. Uh, let's say for instance, you were a, a bad brewer and you forgot to turn on your glycol jacket when you left uh, after knocking out. And then you get a notification on your phone saying, hey, uh, this beer is four degrees hotter than you typically ferment it. Are you sure? And then you could run back out to the brewery and fix your glycol jacket. Um, that, that notification saved me an entire batch of beer uh, because I would have come in the next day and seen that it was at you know, 95 degrees F and realized that that wasn't exactly what I wanted to do with that beer. Um, let's say it wasn't a, a brewer's mistake and it was simply a solenoid got stuck open and all of a sudden you're crashing your tank unexpectedly. What if you were sitting at home and got that notification on your phone that said, hey, this is four degrees lower than you typically ferment it. Are you sure? And you can just pop right in and save that batch. Um, I think that will be pretty significant for a lot of people because 16 hours is a lot of time when it comes to fermenting uh, good beer. Uh, it's conductivity. So this is kind of an interesting uh, metric because we weren't quite sure what it was for when we first put it into the system. Uh, we had an idea, obviously, conductivity is the measurement of the electrical conductivity of a fluid. Um, and so what we've found is actually really significant. So at first, uh, right at knockout, we see that this level of uh, conductivity is an indicator of your brewing salt additions. Um, so this is, again, another process control. This is a way that you can ensure that you uh, reach the same level or consistent level of brewing salt additions over the course of every single batch of this beer that you brew. Um, let's say you mismeasured or forgot to put one thing in, you will get a pretty good indicator of that right here. Um, and then as you proceed with fermentation, we can see that this conductivity drops off over the course uh, of fermentation. This is a pretty good indicator that fermentation is proceeding as planned because this is a uh, gas in solution. So as uh, conductive, or excuse me, as carbon dioxide builds up as fermentation proceeds, it bubbles out of solution and changes the conductivity measurement uh, inside the sensor hub. And then finally, uh, we've noticed two things. One, I should, I should have added one to this graph, but two things. Uh, towards the end, conductivity uh, will come back up, but very slightly lower than where it originated, indicating that some of those ions in solution uh, were consumed or otherwise used by the yeast uh, during their process. And one more thing that we've noticed is uh, dry hopping increases the conductivity. And so if you were to see a dry hop here, you'd see a pretty significant bump in this beer. Um, that is, of course, just more additions of ions from hop material uh, into beer. But it is useful as process control because alongside pH, uh, it gives you a pretty good idea that there is. Uh, that's when you have dry hopped. All right, so I talked a little bit earlier about uh, developing a baseline. And so this is uh, a beer that I brewed over here on the right side, uh, three of them specifically, three batches. And you can see we have a pretty similar trend in uh, all three of these, these are gravity curves, I should, I should say. So we have a pretty similar trend in all three of these gravity curves with some variances uh, because I am not a brewer. I am a scientist first who happens to make beer. Um, and so I didn't maybe nail the, the OG and the FG of each of these beers, but the trend is consistent across three. And so I can average these out and get a pretty good baseline of what my beer should look like as I ferment it. Let's say for instance, you then changed uh, to a new brew house as one of our customers did here down the street. A brewery we work with very closely went from a 10 hectoliter brew house to a 20 barrel brew house, uh, a pretty significant jump. Um, their beers, their, their fermentation profiles didn't change significantly, which says to me that their processes are on point. Uh, they managed to scale up uh, pretty significantly without affecting their beer. Um, or uh, an ingredient, let's say you change to a new malt supplier and you want to 
see how that beer compares to the previous batches of that same brand. Having that baseline ahead of time is going to be very helpful in doing that. And then as, as so on, as you go through every batch uh, and even into the yeast prop, as I was talking about, uh, one yeast crop to the next, watching that change in pH uh, drop or dissolved oxygen uptake or gravity change, all of those will give you an indicator that something is different. And when something's different, if it's good, keep it that way. If it's not as good, make, take actions to correct it. Data to decision. Uh, this is an, a view of our interface um, and how, how we compare fermentations. These are those uh, same three beers um, just in our interface instead of in my graphing software. Um, and so you can see here, you can see all of the um, all of the various parameters that we measure. You can select those on each graph um, and, and compare three fermentations, pHs against each other, three fermentations, gravities against each other, and allow you to really pinpoint uh, where things have changed. And this is uh, that same interface uh, on pH with one of our customers. Um, data here this is the phs of, of three uh, of the same batches of beer and you can see some differences here you can see some starting ph differences they end roughly in the same place but the rate of change is very slightly different um, and this is a, a, a very solid indicator that they have made some changes to their process and they are comparing them against a baseline and really give you a lot of insight into what's happening over the course of that fermentation uh, but again you got to compare it to what you did previously And now we get into uh, a couple of case studies. I think this one is going to be the most interesting. Um, there we are. So Full Steam Brewery uh, here in Durham, they're a customer that we work with uh, pretty closely. They, they uh, you may have seen their head brewer, Eric, on one of our previous webinars. Um, what I wanna discuss here is uh, a really helpful use of data to decision. So this uh, gray beer is a batch of their pale ale. It's a, they brew it very consistently. They brew it all the time. Um, this is a multi-knockout beer. That's why we see these jumps in, in gravity. They started up here and then they knocked out again. And then this fermentation proceeded sort of not super slowly, but it proceeded as normal until it reached their FG uh, down here at maybe 180 hours, thereabouts. They then took that as a baseline and said, well, what can we change? What can we affect on this? Uh, and they decided to increase their pitch rate by between 40 and 50%. And so that's what we can see here in this green fermentation. So this is their uh, first knockout. Obviously they knocked out previously and it had started to ferment. Uh, then they knocked out a second time and it dropped to that final gravity in, uh, let's call it 80 hours. Um, so that's a hundred hours difference. That's over three days. Yeah, thereabouts. Uh, it's well over three days um, of time in tank that this beer spent over the, the increased pitch rate beer. So they took this data and made a decision based on the data. And then they correlated those outcomes. So one thing that I really want to emphasize, and I talk about this a lot, especially with people in my own company, um, you have to have tasting panels. You have to subjectively analyze this beer. So compare that first batch of that pale ale with the second batch. Ensure that nothing is outstandingly different, that it, meet, it meets your expectations for that brand. And then decide that, yes, that was a procedure that we want to continue with. It matches uh, the, the brand's identity and it increased our output through efficiency, not through uh, capital um, input. I think that's very important for a lot of folks. Uh, this is another, uh, uh, I really enjoy showing this slide because I think it's something that a lot of people are interested in and maybe know something about, but uh, it's, it's a little bit of that popular wisdom you know that these things may happen, but getting them on paper with empirical data is really the important part to me. Uh, this is a beer that I brewed in-house right over here in our little system. Um, it's a half barrel tank. 
and I dry hopped this with about four ounces of um, pellet, T45 pellet, T90 pellet, T90 pellet. Uh, so we can see that this beer proceeded as normal. This is a, a standard fermentation for this beer. And then I dry hopped it. Uh, I dry hopped it right around here. And so this is uh, one of the features that we can do, overlay two of our parameters. So this gray line is the pH of the beer. Uh, and this green is the gravity of the beer. So two significant changes. One, you can see this increase in pH uh, during the two dry hops. So two ounces here, two ounces there. Um, and the other significant change is this bump in, in gravity, uh, right? We talk about hop creep quite a bit. And with the advent of uh, New England IPAs and super late hop additions and uh, canning as fresh as possible, hop creep has suddenly become vitally important to a lot of breweries. So being able to identify it and recognize exactly when that uh, re-fermentation has finished, not only that, identifying the changes to potential flavor, as pH is flavor positive, is going to be a huge deal for a lot of people. Um, I want to point that out because this is the first time I had dry hopped one of our beers with a fermentation monitor, with a brew monitor on it, and it uh, it kind of blew me away. I was very excited that we could see it in that level of detail. And now we get into sort of the, the less good side of it, uh, stalled fermentation. So this here, I would actually call it more like a failure to launch fermentation. Uh, this was one of our partner breweries um, and they were testing out, uh, they wanted to make a seltzer, of course, this is part of the trend of the industry. Um, they wanted to make, excuse me, they wanted to make an imperial seltzer. Uh, so this imperial seltzer um, knocked out, you know, roughly 18 to 19 Play-Doh uh, and then didn't move over the course of, we'll call that four days, four and change days. Uh, and then we see this little change in gravity here and then this steep drop off well afterwards. So what happened here and how can we prevent that? So as I overlay conductivity over this graph, we can see a couple of interesting things. One, the conductivity starts off very, very low. Uh, if you recall from one of the previous slides, we had a beer with a conductivity of about 1900 micro siemens per centimeter. Uh, this is down in the 300 range. So this seltzer at being just water and sugar with very little uh, ions in it, very few ions in it, super low conductivity. And then we see this bump right here. Uh, and what that is, is a nutrient addition. So this brewer added some nutrients in hopes that it would kickstart fermentation and really take off. Um, so we see this, this movement in gravity that started to affect it a bit. Uh, clearly there was some activity, but not a significant amount. And then this second major jump is uh, a turbo yeast addition. They, they hydrated some turbo yeast, which of course has yeast nutrient in it. Um, and that really popped off this fermentation. It took off and dropped that 19, 18 to 19 Play-Doh to zero Play-Doh in about two days, two and a half days there. Um, so monitoring this with a brew monitor and having alerts set up would allow you to really understand that this fermentation was stalled sort of here. Uh, and you'd be able to take that data, make a decision with it, add that probably turbo yeast at this point, and get that fermentation finished as soon as possible without using up 10 days of tank time. And finally, uh, we're going to get in, into some of the um, side business benefits that I talked about earlier. So. Uh, City Built Brewing out in Grand Rapids, Michigan. They are a really interesting company um, and they're making some very cool beers. Uh, they really like to take, and this is the quote from their head brewer, uh, they want to take strange beers and make them familiar to uh, the, the craft beer uh, consumer base at large and take the familiar styles of beer and make them new and interesting. That much experimentation carries with it some risk. Um, whether that be a batch that didn't go quite as you expected, or um, maybe the, the, the beer didn't turn out quite as you hoped. 
Um, and so one way to mitigate that risk is to understand exactly what's happening in that tank at all times. And so this beer requires some cutting edge tech. Um, and so we really appreciate Rob for, for shouting us out. And honestly, I'm excited to get up there and drink their beer. Secondly, we got Western Red. Uh, Western Red <laughs> is uh, was founded and run by uh, a man named Denver who has one of the finest mustaches in craft beer. Um, and if you're in the industry, you know that that's very high praise. Uh, this man runs the entire place by himself, essentially, with, uh, with some help coming in for canning days. And so when you have an entire business run by yourself, uh, that means you are there seven days a week because fermentation doesn't stop on the weekends. And so this type of thing can benefit him in that making sure that he can get data on those days where he doesn't maybe have to go into the brewery is pretty huge for that, for that work-life separation. Um, we've all seen a little bit of encroachment with, uh, you know, having to take meetings at home, things like that have, have really impacted all of us. I think just stretching out that separation a little bit can be a big deal for a lot of folks. Not only that, but then rotating shifts. Um, I know when I was working weekends at a brewery, I didn't care for it one bit. So just uh, increasing overall happiness can have a larger impact on a business than really anything that you can put down on paper. And so just to wrap up, uh, we are reaching the end here. That's perfect. We got about 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions, you can start putting them down there in the comments uh, and I will address them as they come in. So to wrap things up, uh, control, right? We really wanna emphasize that everything that happens in that tank should be under your control. Not being able to see what's happening or having to take manual samples can diminish the amount of control you have over your beer. And we wanna fix that. Uh, repeatability, right? This is huge in the industry, as I mentioned. Um, brand identity is is critical to establishing your brand as a whole. Um, efficiency, just making sure that you can use your your people as they are expected to be used, right? You don't want a brewer running around taking samples from a tank when they could be brewing better beer. Um, and finally, accuracy, just taking out some of the guesswork. Um, and understanding exactly when fermentation starts, when it finishes, when you can do your VDK rest, when it's time to dry hop. All of that is going to make your life much easier because you can make the decisions with no guessing. Um, I will be doing a Q&A here for as long as there are questions. So if you have them, bring them on in. Um, if you have questions after this, you can uh, visit that website there, precisionfermentation.com or go ahead and email info at precisionfermentation.com. That will get you to the right folks. All righty. I want to apologize for most of that presentation. Uh, there was a mouse <laughs> that scared me several times, uh, so I'll be handling that here in a bit. Working out here in the woods, uh, meet a lot of interesting um, co-workers. I had a black snake come through the brewery the other week. How does the system alert you of a problem? Thank you, Edward. Yes, so we have two uh, parameters or two ways that will alert. Um, you can get a text or an email uh, or both, your choice, and it can be sent to as many people as you'd like. So essentially what you will do is as you establish uh, your beer's parameters, i.e. its starting point and its ending point, um, for any of the metrics that we measure, you can set up an alert and it will be sent uh, directly to your phone, email, whatever you'd like um, when, it, when that parameter strays out of spec. So for instance, if you set your beer to ferment at 68 Fahrenheit, uh, you can set a window above and below 68 and say, I don't want it to go below 66 or above 71. And then if the fluid temperature strays out of that range, you'll catch an email or a text.
Right on. So as folks get their comments in, oh, well, that was quick. Thank you, Edward. Uh, Mr. Jeff, system as good as, it, as it, it's calibrated. Yes. So uh, there are two systems in place for calibration. Number one, uh, we handle all the calibration in-house. Um, and so we calibrate all of the parameters before the sensor hub goes out the door. The second part of that is uh, we have a, a rotating uh, maintenance schedule. And so every six months to a year, we will send out a fresh sensor hub that has been newly calibrated. We'll pull that old one back in. We'll check all the sensors, make sure they're operating as normal, make sure all the pumps are functioning as expected, that is running the latest firmware. Um, really, we are not in the business of selling this hardware. Uh, we want to sell this service. Um, the, the, the service is really the, the access to the data, all of the alert functionality, all of the analytics functionality. Um, we have a benchmarking system that is really exciting to me. Um, and so we'll recalibrate those as necessary and then send them back. Um, and sort of the third way is a, a pH compensation. And so pH being the most variable of all of the um, parameters that we measure. Uh, if you do choose to take a manual sample from a tank, you can put that into our, our console and then uh, the system will auto calibrate to, to that pH level. Mr. Jeff, 1964, I like that. And thank you for your question. While we're while we're chilling here together, I'll just touch on some of the other uh, frequently asked questions, things that I've gotten from other um, webinars and things that I've done. Um, the first is how it connects to a tank. So we have a one and a half inch uh, tri clamp tank connector. Um, it is a stainless steel, uh, uh, full fully three hundred four stainless uh, system that will hook right up to a one and a half inch tri clamp port. Um, it has stainless steel ball valves on it. Um, what about cleaning? Yes, thank you. I will get to that. Uh, so that sensor, that that tank connector comes with, or you get two tank connectors with every sensor hub, and so you can hook up one to a tank. Uh, and then when that beer is finished fermenting, you can close off those ball valves, remove the sensor hub, clean it, and then put it onto the next tank. Um, and that way you get as much data as as possible across two fermentations without having to sit on tank for the less interesting part of fermentation. Um, Mr. Jeff, 1964, what about cleaning? Yes, so we have a uh, CIP, SIP system. Um, so you take that sensor hub off your tank, uh, you put it onto a cleaning cart, then we have three buckets. So we have a rinse bucket, cleaning bucket, and a sanitizing bucket. Uh, and you will rinse the sensor hub to clear out any potential uh, debris that may be left in there, yeast that accumulated, things like that. Um, we will recirculate uh, cleaning fluid, uh, a non-caustic alkaline cleaner, like PBW, like a cellar master. Um, it'll recirculate that for an hour, then you rinse it, and then uh, circulate, uh, we recommend peracetic acid as our sanitizer. So you recirculate that for an hour as well, and then that central hub is cleaned and ready to put onto a new tank. Lauder Ale Brewery, uh, installation process for probe. I do have a picture, battery operated, rechargeable probe. <laughs> I wish I could discuss that. Um, installation process. Yes, I don't have a picture. What I do have is, so this here is our tank connector. Uh, like I said, 304 stainless, uh, high pressure rated ball valves. Um, this is the one and a half inch TC. So this will go right onto your tank, tri clamped in, close these valves off, and this will sanitize and uh, be cleaned as normal as part of your tank. So you can put in caustic, put in PAA. Um, if you have an autoclave big enough, this is fully autoclavable. Feel free to chuck it in there. Um, so this will connect to the tank. The sensor hub will be connected to this bracket portion and tubes connected to these valves. Uh, and then you'll just open up all the valves, purge the system of its PAA, and it's ready to rock. Um, picture of the sensor hub. I don't have a picture of a sensor hub. I do have a sensor. 
here. There is, there's the size comparison. So it's about the size of a shoebox. It was about 13 pounds. Hooked up to a tank. Battery operated, unfortunately, I cannot discuss it this time. Uh, suffice it to say, uh, it has been widely requested. Oh, and thank you, Lauder Ale Brewery. I love that name. Edward again with the solid questions. Is there any beer waste in the sensor? No, that is one of the biggest things about this system that we, we really wanted to emphasize when we started out building it is no beer waste. This is a viable system for any size brewery because we're not wasting you know, 10, 20, 30 milliliters per sample. Uh, it recirculates. And so as we pull beer through the system, it gets measured and then put back into your tank. Um, for larger breweries, right, this would be less of an issue to, to lose X number of liters of beer per, per day wouldn't be a huge deal. But if you're brewing a one barrel batch or a three barrel batch, that's a pretty significant amount of wastage. Um, and, and we wanted this to be available to everybody. So no beer waste. Um, the one exception to that would be while purging the system, uh, we want to open all those valves, open the sample port, purge the PAA through the system with some wort pushing it through. So you'll lose uh, a couple of mils of wort as you do that, and that's it. And then any sampling you take after that, if you wanna take manual samples as well, uh, that, would be, that would be the sum of it. Thank you, Edward, for that. All right, I'll hang out for about another two minutes. Um, so long as questions keep rolling in, I'm happy to answer. Um, a couple other things, uh, just what we got going on here at Precision Fermentation. Um, since I am, oh, cool. Thank you, CBP. Of course, you guys are the best. I, I love doing these. Mr. Jeff. Can you go from a stout to an IPA without any tweaking of the gravity sensor or is it just okay for all? Yes, so uh, it is okay for everything. It's gravity measurement range is from 0 0.5 grams per centimeter to cubic centimeter to two grams per cubic centimeter, which in brewing terms is the widest possible range that I could think of. Um, you know, in, in specific gravity, it is essentially 0.5 to two dot. So uh, that's wider than any beer, really any fluid that I know of, except for some of those higher end ones. But uh, yes, it is good to go for all of those. Uh, we've done a few <laughs> uh, with some customers, we've done a few ciders and some seltzers that go into the negative Play-Doh. Uh, so sub one dot uh, for specific gravity. And uh, I believe the highest that I've seen is uh, in terms of uh, density has been in the 30s. So quite a range with no issues. And thank you for your question. Mr. Jeff, 1964, coming out here crushing it. Um, and so as I said, a couple of uh, things that we got coming up for the company. Uh, we have a big announcement coming out tomorrow uh, that I was told not to discuss too in depth, uh, but keep an eye out on that. Um, I'm very excited about it here in the development side of the company. Uh, I'm always looking forward to the next thing. I have to be reminded to just, no, 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 we have a great product. Let's, uh, let's sell this product first, but I'm always looking forward to the next. Um, so that's, that's what we do here in, in the testing facility.
All right. I believe we'll uh, we'll put a pin there. Um, once again, I want to thank Craft Beer Professionals and, and Andrew specifically for putting all this together for us. Um, it's it's always very gratifying to be able to come out and, and discuss what we're doing and, and get great feedback. Um, and so thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for your questions. Uh, again, if you have any questions, info at precisionfermentation.com. Shoot an email over there. Um, if it's something that relates to me, it will be directed to me and I will answer you uh, as soon as I can. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you.